All right. Well, I, I had a chance. Uh, this uh, it would be this morning my time. Last night your time. I had a chance to meet with RJ, and we were talking about all of the the things needed to set up for the the class. So we're getting things in motion for the module four workshop. Again, that's going to be June twenty twenty uh, seventh to July 1st. So we're gonna focus on just going Monday to Friday uh, that week together for the module four workshop. So make sure you have that on your calendars and we're working out all the details uh, with RJ. So have it at Living Word Banawa like we have in the past. And, um, and hopefully everything will work out okay for that. So, and just looking forward to seeing you guys there for that opportunity. Again, that's uh, starting June 27th. So make sure to get your uh, calendar set up for that. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is just um, continuing on the next few weeks. We're going to meet for a couple of more weeks, I think, until um, till the twenty, uh, the nineteenth. I think the twentieth be our our last day. So a few, few more, just a couple more sessions after this one. And I've just been focusing the last several weeks on um, the next steps to prepare you for the assignments. And so I thought it might be helpful to just put together uh, the just over our, overall where we're at as far as that's concerned and the various steps in the exegetical process for studying prophecy. Um, we'll get more into it when we gather together in the module four workshop, but um, the assignments that I've noted here and then the session. So trying to give you so if you in the down the road when you're working on these assignments, you can have a reference point as to which sessions we talked about that. So you have a place you can go to review if you've forgotten any of the uh, uh, what what's involved in that particular step. And so uh, the last time we got together last week, the session 32 of module four, we went over some diagramming principles. Um, and that covers that along with what we're going to talk about today will be covered in assignment number 12 from module four. And if you go back and I've noted here the other assignment numbers for the other steps, all right, and the sessions where we talked about that particular step. So you can Head there, obviously, for a prophecy, a, a key uh, series of discussions would be from sessions four, uh, 11 to 14 for module four. So if you go back, that was the prophetic analysis, which is the, the unique step when we're studying the prophetic genre. Um, and so I will, uh, this will be on your notes that I send out to you guys uh, uh, later today or tomorrow. And it'll have these references for you. But uh, hopefully today we'll finish up with the sixth and seventh steps. And that will that will give you what you need to know for the assignment 12. And then in the next uh, week or so, we'll hopefully finish the review, the rest of the steps uh, for you. But like I said, when we, when we get to the module four workshop, we'll uh, be able to address and cover a lot of the assignments and I can help you with any specific assignments you want to work on. In the meantime, uh, I noticed some of you have been working on your module one, two, and three assignments, and that's great. Now, some of you haven't gotten to those, so I want to encourage you. We have about a little more than a month for you to get done with all of those assignments for modules one, two, and three. Uh, next week, I will try to send out to you let me write myself a note for this. I'll send out to you sort of an update of um, what is left for you to do. I sent one out to you a few weeks ago, what the specific assignments that, um, that you needed to, each of you needed to uh, complete and upload to Canvas. So I'm going to do that again, just give an update so each of you can know where you're at. And again, the focus is get modules uh, one, two, and three done. Um, so, and then when we get to the workshop, that way you can, if you have any sermons yet to preach for, from any of those previous modules, you can preach them at that time. In fact, let me pull up 
I put together a preliminary um, uh, well, it's kind of small here. Make it a little bigger. Just a preliminary uh, preaching lab assignments. And I'll just show that to you real quick. Not all of you are, are here to see, but uh, this is basically, Lord willing, we'll have these various sermons that uh, each of the guys are going to going to preach. Um, there may be a a sermon if I have if you preached it and and you sent me a link or something I don't have it for whatever reason let me know but again I'll be contacting you by Facebook Messenger hopefully by next week and we I'll give you an update but basically we're going to have several sermons most of them will be from Proverbs the Proverbs passage but some of you have some from Psalms and even a few from Module Two uh, from the your John your Old Test your New Testament narrative passage right so. We're going to have several sermons. We're going to have preaching labs when we gather together for module four. But the focus will be on preaching your sermons from modules one, two, or three. Now, if you want to, if uh, I know some of you have been staying up on your prophecy assignments. So if you want to preach one of your prophecy sermons, if you've done all your assignments, you're welcome to do that for module four workshop. Um, if you want to, you know, wait till module five, that's fine. That's when we normally would preach those. But if you want to get ahead a little bit or get that out of the way, you're more than welcome to preach um, your one of your prophetic texts if you've done all your written assignments. Just let me know about that, okay? But the focus will be on module four workshop is completing all the assignments from the first three modules. And then we'll We'll go over some things uh, related to the prophetic genre as well, and then I'll give you some time to be working on any present assignments you need to finish uh, to either catch up or to uh, to keep working ahead. Um, so that's that's the plan, and I think Monday through Friday, June twenty seventh to July first, will be a, enough time to cover to cover those. All right, so we won't be meeting together on the Saturday like norm we normally do since this is a sort of a special workshop. And during that workshop as well, we'll be collecting the tuition uh, fees and, and all of that too. So um, so just wanna keep that in front of you uh, and remind you of that. Uh, RJ is gonna be contacting each of you guys just to confirm your attendance. So those of you who are here and then those of you maybe that are watching the video later, um, just be, be uh, prepared just to get a contact from RJ just to confirm that you're becoming. So we know how many syllabus. Oh, by the way, I will give you a full syllabus for module four. So you'll have it all a print, a printed version uh, for the whole thing. Uh, so I've been giving you handouts each week from what we cover, but this, this will have it all in one place uh, for you. So that will also be made available at the module four workshop. Okay. Any questions on that before we dive into to this morning's topic. Everyone's okay, no questions. No Everyone's questions. excited. Woo we gather together. <laughs> Excuse me, Pastor Tim. Sorry, yes, Sandy, what's that? Yeah, uh, in module one, I have a, I think a late assignment about reading. You have sent me the, but I could no longer access my canvas. <laughs> Oh, do you have the same log, log password? Yeah, but my computer before the program is corrupted. I put everything there. Now I try to access Canvas. Uh, I, I could not <laughs> enter the, it, the Canvas. What what message do you get back? Does it let you do you are you able to try to log in? Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I don't know if the canvas is still available because it's no longer in my computer. All I have is the TMSI. Yeah, if you, well, try this, try here, um, type uh, canvas. Please, I can, uh, uh, could you please send me the link for the reading assignment? Yeah, because, I just uh, I sent it on it. the chat here. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Tim, because that's the only thing I, I need for my uh my reading and 
also my module four. Yeah, for modules. So yeah, for for modules uh, one, two, and three. Um, you guys will use the canvas dot instructure dot com. Yeah, for module four, different. you'll use the TMEI. TMEI, yeah. But I don't, I don't, I don't have problem with the TMEI. Okay. Only for the canvas because my my files already been correct, corrupted. Yeah. So just try that the web link I sent on the chat and uh, because another brother was having trouble, but he was actually was typing in the wrong website. So it wasn't even getting to the website. Yeah, yeah, actually I, I tried, but it really confused me because there's another website for the canvas. Yeah, yeah, use the one uh, that I sent on the chat. Maybe I'll, I'll post that as well. Okay, Pastor Tim, thank you. All right, thank you for the question. And I think it's important to, uh, you know, maybe some of you might wonder, you know, what. What's, maybe I missed an assignment or two from a previous module. Is that a, a big deal? What's important about that is there's a couple of reasons why I, I want to make sure you complete your assignments from the previous modules. Uh, one is just, you know, need to finish the assignments just for, you know, to get a certificate for the program that you've completed the program. But also, two, we want to make sure that, that you guys are at least going through each of the steps. Now, I understand that when you, you know, in ministry, sometimes there's time pressure and other things. You're not going to do all of these steps. I, I get that. You know, sometimes I skip some of the steps, um, depending on, you know, the time I have available. But we at least want you, we've, we really feel like these steps that we've given you for each of these genres um, will really help you best understand how to, how to, study and find the original author's intent. And so we want you to at least have tried doing each of these steps, have ex been exposed to them, and hope, hopefully, you know, some of them you will incorporate in your course of regular study and preparation. Uh, we feel very strongly that they're gonna help you be more effective in rightly interpreting a passage. So we wanna make sure that you've at least gone through each of the steps on a couple of passages, just so you have that exposure and experience to the process. Uh, a third reason uh, is actually too, in completing these, you may decide later you wanna apply for a, uh, another degree program uh, and you'll, you'll want, uh, some, some guys have done that and have asked us for transcripts, you know, to because some, some places will, will allow, um, We'll give you credit for for a class like this. So if you need to have your assignments done, so there's you know something on your transcript that we could send. Or if you decide uh, later, uh, Taya is working on hopefully in the next few years getting an MDiv program together um, that is uh, accredited, and so this course could be applied to that if you decide at a later point to pursue a degree with with Taya. And the MDiv program. So those are just a few reasons I think it's important. And, and just, you know, we want to work at being diligent to show ourselves approved. And so my desire is I send you updates about what assignments you have left is I, I'm not trying to make you feel bad or guilty or, you know, like, you know, you better get these done. But it's really because I know in the long run, it will benefit you, even though sometimes some of these assignments may seem like, um, you know, just a lot of work and maybe you don't see the immediate benefit from it. But but I think that in the long run, over time, uh, hopefully you'll uh, recognize there is uh, some benefit to being exposed to these things. So all that said, um, just want to, you know, please take any updates that I send you or any encouragements to, to catch up, not as a rebuke, but just uh, that I, I really want to help and I think of, you know finishing these up and doing uh, doing the assignments will, will be a help to you in the long run so uh, thankfully you know fortunately I think we have opportunity right now to sort of get you know get caught up and have a reset by just having this module for a workshop together and then Lord willing uh, in early October 
gather back again for module five and be on track, Lord willing, for graduation, maybe next, you know, uh, March or something like that. So, um, so just again, brothers, just keep do your best and anything you need for, for me to help you doing that, please, please just contact me. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, spend the time we have left to focusing our attention on the particular topic for today, and that is to just review some of the elements for assignment 12 in the exegetical process, which assignment 12 covers these three particular steps. And these are steps that you've done before. Uh, they are not unique. We did them with epistles. We did them with poetry. Um, uh, and also as well, in, in part, you did them with narratives. And so these won't be anything new. Uh, in fact, they'll be very similar to what you did for the poetic and epistolary, epistolary genres. So hopefully this will just be a, a, a review, a refresher for you in uh, remembering how to, how to do that. And again, I posted an example online. If you go to, to the uh, TMEI uh, Canvas course, um, there is a, an example of assignment that, that you'll get there. In fact, I'll, I'll just show it to you real quick. Just so let me take you to, so hopefully you guys, can you guys see the, my, my uh, internet webpage here? Everybody see it? Okay. Yes. Yes. All right, good. So, so it's, uh, yeah, again, tmai.instructure.com. Whoops, this site can't be reached. Well, that's the same problem Sandy was having. All right, let me try this again. Uh, what is my problem here? Let me try this. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to put this online. If, if the other uh, link doesn't work, uh, try these. I'm going to post on the chat. Uh, TMAI dot structure. All right. So we hit the login page and you won't have this many on your your account but you should see a preaching four and as i've mentioned several times just that large font link right in the middle of the page under syllabus let's go there and then we'll head down to um what you'll see is these are module four each of the sessions and the last session was session 32. And so there, notice we've got the notes and then the video of the class and then the assignment. I went ahead and posted it. So this is the assignment that will cover uh, steps five, six, and seven on the process. And notice I give the instructions for the assignment. So the steps in this case to complete the diagram for, for your, shouldn't say poem, it should say uh, your prophetic text. Make textual observations, which we're going to do in a moment, and then conduct word studies. And then I give you an example from Obadiah on how to do each of those steps. There's the steps for the diagram. Let's see, hopefully you can see this. And then here's the steps for the observations. And then the steps, an example, sorry, for, for the word study. And then I give you some space here to do it yourself for your passage. And again, I mentioned this last week, but let me just remind you one more time. For your Zechariah passage, somebody asked me a question. It was really good uh, that you did. That in Zechariah, part of it is in narrative form. And then part of it is the... the the sermon or the, the statement or the instruction. So what I did was basically just gave you what verses you need to diagram from your passage. OK, 
Okay, you don't have to do the whole chapter or all the passage you were given because some of it's narrative. So for example, if you have the Zechariah 3 passage, you really only need to diagram verses 7 to 10. All right, you don't have to do the whole thing. You can if you want, but I think the, the most helpful part would be verses 7 to 10 in that chapter. So for each of the passages that I assign from Zechariah, I actually give you the verses to diagram. And those of you that have Zechariah 1, 18 to 21, really have it nice. You just have one verse that you need to worry about for diagramming, okay? So then I give you on this assignment, the, I give you space for you to complete your the assignment for your passage here, all right? So all of that is given right there on, on that link, or you can go to assignments, and then you'll need to uh, look for assignment 12. Uh, It's posted yet. Maybe I don't have it posted yet. Why can't I find assignment 12 here? There's a 10, 11. Oh, there it is. No, that's video. Assignment 10, assignment 411, 414. Oh, I'll have to check that. For some reason, it's not showing up there. I'll fix that. I'll fix that. All right. So, let's see here. Maybe it's not published. Ah, I didn't publish it. That's why you can't. All right. Now you'll see. All right. Now let me do this. Okay. So, when you go to assignments, you could click that link. Then we should now see assignment 4.12. Yeah, there it is right here. So that's the one we're working on right now. So you go to that assignment and then hit start assignment. You can also um, um, download it here as well and then upload the file when you're done. All right. So, all right. Anyway, sorry for that diversion here. Let's go back to the, the notes here. Um, unless there's any questions on that. Again, that's just accessing the the Canvas software. Anybody have any questions? Okay, yeah, I know it's not the most interesting, but I want to just make sure um, you guys are fully aware of how to do that. <clears throat> so with that, let's go to, again, uh, we just finished last time we gathered. Uh, looking at the diagram. So I want to review this week, Lord willing, the textual observation and significant words. And again, the focus there will be on the part of your text that you diagram. All right. We want to make uh, additional uh, analysis of uh, the, that passage and particularly looking at textual observation looks at the passage from an, another point of view, looking for very specific things that will help give you more insight into the, the text, all right? And if you remember, um, the observations being made uh, are being the same as what we did for the epistles. And so one of the key elements that we want to analyze are the verbs, okay? Verbs carry the action, they carry, they move the thinking, uh, uh, the, the flow of thought. And so they're a very important component to uh, analyze, to look for. And if you remember, there were three characteristics of a verb uh, that we wanted to consider and think about. Does anybody remember uh, at least one of those three characteristics of a verb? Voice. Yeah, good. So voice is one. And what mood? Any, what's that? The mood. Of the yes, good. The mood. Means. And the tense. tense. Very good. That's right. Now for the tense, uh, in English, what tenses do we have? There's three primary. Past, future, ah. present. Yeah, past, present. Future and future, all right? 
Now in Greek, there's like five or six tenses. In Hebrew, there's two. So, but English, we have three. So we're just working from the English translations. Um, how about voice? Remember? Active and passive. Active good. and passive. Good, good, German. Uh, active and passive. Uh, voice. And then for the mood. Indicative mode. Indicative, Indicative. good. Uh, imperative. About imperative. Imperative. Declarative. Okay, declarative would be the same as indicative. Okay. Um, indicative, imperative, there's another one that, that's for questions. What's that? Interrogative, yeah. Conditional mode. And then there's one called the subjunctive, all right? How about now, conditional mode? Conditional, yeah, technically that's a mood, but um, I don't, I don't um, usually include it because in the conditional case, it is really dependent on the on another verb. So, um, but yeah, technically that is a, a mood that you might see in English grammars. Uh, let me see here. Now, when we talk about voice, or, or let's start with um, with with mood, right? What is the in, indicative mood? About statement or facts, Pastor Tim. Yes, very good. Yeah, you can think of the indicative mood as it indicates something. Indicative, indicate. It indicates uh, something. It is a statement of fact or a declaration. Okay. I hit the ball. All right, that's just a statement of something that took place. Or I am happy. That's just a statement uh, of fact. All right, now how about the imperative? It's a command. Oh, come on, that's come a on. command. That's right. Uh, do something. <laughs> so an indicative is it indicates something. An imperative is do something. So it's given the form of a command. And remember in English, imperatives, the subject uh, when it's directed to the second person, you or your, uh, you, it, you don't include the you. You don't say you, um, uh, you know, preach the gospel. Because that would sound like that would actually be indicative. You preach the gospel. But if I was going to make a command, I would say preach the gospel. Like Paul did in Galatians, in uh, 2 Timothy 4. All right. Here, the implied subject is you. you. Okay. But if I said you preach the gospel, that could be taken as an indicative, all right, depending on the context. Uh, but normally in a command, you don't include you. Now, if it's a third person command, brothers, let us preach the gospel, that is an imperative as well for, in the third person. And you would put let us, all right? Okay, how about the interrogative? Asking questions. That's a Any question. Case? You know, interrogate, ask questions. All right, an example would be, you know, did you preach the gospel? Okay. Am I happy? That The verb here, preach or am, in this case, it's in the interrogative. It's a question. All right. Now, how about the subjunctive? Anyone remember what that is? Can't remember. Remember it 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 uh, it uh, suggests probability mm. or doubt, right? Like indicative is just making a statement. There's no doubt. Um, imperative is giving a command. Interrogative, it's asking a question, but the subjunctive is it's presenting some potential doubt, like uh, he maybe. might preach the gospel. Or maybe. Or, right, I may be happy. Right, I'm not sure. There's some doubt about the, about it. Okay? Yeah. Or even you might say, uh, you know, you should go to church, okay? So there's 
introducing a degree of uncertainty. Maybe that's a, uh, or a degree of uncertainty or uncertainty, I'll just put it that way, about the action. And in English, that's often presented by the helper verb, might or may or should, okay? Now, yes, conditional is a mood. That would be something like, if I am happy, I will, I, will go to church. I will go to church. But see here, really the um, the main verb here is will go, which is indicative. All right. So um, I don't, I think the conditional isn't really uh, straightforward. I, I don't worry about the conditional mood because it, uh, which verb I'm looking at, um, you know, technically, yeah, the verb am would be a conditional in the conditional sense, because it may or may not be happening. But um, I typically don't don't worry about that too much. But but there is a conditional verb. Now, most of the verbs you will encounter are going to be in the indicative or the imperative. All right. You will find some interrogative and some subjunctive, but most will be indicative or imperative. Now, now the voice. Very important to understand the voice. There's active and passive. Anybody remember what those two are? Or one of the two? Uh, the subject uh, is the okay. one. That, uh, the, uh, in active voice, uh, Pastor Tim, it was, it is the active brings the emphasis on the sentence. Okay. It means the, the importance of the sentence. Okay. It has to do with the, the uh, how the subject is related to the verb. The subject is the one doing the action. Yeah. When it's sure. active, the subject is doing the action. But when it's, when it's passive, what's that again? Sorry, can't say again? If voice means the subject is to act, to act, to make the action. Yeah, the passive is the, the action is being done to the subject. And then subject, the recipient. Reverse, yeah. reverse. The of the sub yeah, it's the reverse. It's the recipient of. So, like an active would be, um, I preach the word. All right. I is the subject, remember, and preach. Preach is this. I'm doing the action, right? That's the action. But a passive case would be, the word was preached by me. Okay. So, here, the word is the subject. But the subject's not doing the action. The action's being done to the subject in this case. All right. So, so that's the difference is just is the subject doing the action or receiving the action? Um, and then I mentioned this in Greek. There's a third voice that is the subject is doing the action to or for himself. So for example, and in English, this is how it might show up. I, I preached um, the gospel to myself. I preached, yeah, the word. You might see to myself, or you might see... Uh, um, uh what might be another he gave himself a gift all right here the subject he is doing the action gave and then english might include that pronoun himself to show that this idea all right but but english there's only active and passive so uh, i'm just mentioning to you greek has this third one keep in mind all right, and then of course, past, present, and future, uh, that's just the time of the action relative to the speaker, okay? So keep that in mind. 
And those are the most important, the verb, analyzing the verb. So in this step, you just take each of the verbs in the passage and uh, identify. In fact, let's just do that instead of instead of going through all these first. So let, let's take the Obadiah passage here and let's just go ahead and do this for in the Obadiah text. This is the text we diagrammed last week. This is Obadiah, so 10 to 14. We diagrammed it um, last week. And now let's let's apply this. So we're gonna just analyze the verbs um, by each verse. So what I'm gonna do is just call on each of you guys to, to, to in, read the verse and then just tell us uh, what verbs you see and then give us the three characteristics. So uh, let's see. Uh, Pastor Herman, let's start with you. And you just do, ver if you could do verse 10. So verse 10, uh, the verb is, <clears throat> will be covered, will be cut off. Okay. So one verb is, uh, will be covered. So let's do that one. What's the tense of that? Future. Future, yeah. Will be cut off. What's the voice? Or mood, sorry, mood. Uh, that is mood. Uh, that is indicative. Very good. It's making a statement. And then the voice? Uh, active. Okay. Again, the... Uh, uh, the subject is you, right? So you will be covered. So is the subject doing the action or is the action being done to the subject? The, the subject being done, being done to the subject. The, yeah, that the is, subject's being covered. It did if it if it were active, it would say it would have said this: you will cover. That's active. Uh, okay. The subject so you, passive. but be covered, that's passive. Passive. Uh, yeah. Okay, because it's saying you, the subject, is going to have the action done to it. So you will be covered. All right. Okay, so that oh, so this should make it easy the next one, right? You said we'll be cut off. So what's the tense? Future, indicative, and then passive. Yes, it's the exact same. All right. All right, very good. Okay, let's do verse 11. I'm gonna uh, Eric, are you there? How about you, Joshua? Yes, Pastor Tim. Yeah, can you read verse 11 and then uh, identify the verbs? Okay. Um, wait for a while. On that day, uh, on the day that you stood aloof on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. You too were as one of them. All right, so let's just uh, go ahead and identify verbs. Stood. Stood. All right, and what? Carried. Carried, good. Uh, entered. Entered, yes. And cast lots. And cast lots. Cast, the verb. yep. Good. Uh, I think that's all I can see. Uh, technically, were also is the other ah, word. Okay. okay, good. Well, let's just go through these. So, stood again, what's the tense, the voice, and the mood? Um, past. Good, past tense. On that day, you stood aloof. That happened in the past relative to the speaker. Okay. How about the mood? Is it asking a question or giving a command? Giving a command. Okay. Is it is it making a command? Is he telling them that to stand aloof or... 
I think it's just a statement. It's a declaration. I think it's just a statement. Yeah, it's just a statement, right? He's not commanding and he's not asking a question and there's no doubt. He doesn't say you might stand. So what does that leave us? What, what mood? Indicative. Yes. Wow. Joshua, you sound a lot like Ruel. <laughs> um, okay, because it's he's making a statement on the day you stood aloof. So he's just declaring something that took place. He's not making a command or asking a question. All right. Okay, uh, Joshua, what's the voice? Is it active or passive? Is the subject doing the action or receiving it? I think it's, I think it's uh, active. Yeah, notice the subject, you, did the action. You stood. Okay, but the action wasn't done to the subject. He's doing the action. All right. How about the next one, Carrie? Uh, yep. Yep. Then, then. Again, okay, here are your indicative. Yeah, here are your four moods. Remember, we have, I'll just go up here. Remember, the moods are here. Indicative, that indicates something, a statement of fact. So yes, this is indicative. And what's the voice? Active or passive? Uh, active. Yeah. Again, just ask yourself who's doing the action uh, or what is the subject doing the action or receiving the action? That's the question you answer. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Enter. Enter. Yep. Then, yeah. Indicative. Yep. yep. Active. Yeah. Seeing a pattern here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. How about cast? Uh, fast. I think it's just fast. Yeah. Indicative and active. Yep. It's the same. And then were past indicative and active. All right, good. Now notice, so the first <laughs> verse, verse 10, is both their future tense, they're indicative and they're passive. So God's declaring judgment upon them and what's going to happen to them in the future. Verse 11, these are all past tense, indicative, active, because they're all... God's making a statement about things they did. So the, the reason that they're going to suffer this consequence in verse 10 is being given in verse 11. This is going to happen to you because you did these things, past tense, active voice, um, in the past. All right, good. Okay, Ruel, I know you've been, uh, you've been wanting to do these, so it's your turn. <laughs> Go ahead and do verse 12. Verse 12, it says, Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune. And do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Uh, first verb is gloat. Uh, rejoice, do not rejoice, and boast. Uh, 
Okay, good. We are all technically it's do gloat not... is the verb and do rejoice and do boast. Um not is actually an adverb. It's modifying the verb and it's basically saying the opposite, right? Yeah. Yeah. So not modifies gloat and it's telling it, you know, the opposite. Don't don't gloat. So, but anyway, yeah. Okay, so we have verbs here. Do gloat. What tense is that? Present tense. Good. Present tense and that is uh, imperative. Yes. He's a command, isn't it? Do not gloat. He's telling them to do something. Or not do something in this case. And active. Yes, active. Subject doing the action. All right, how about rejoice? Same. Yes. All right, and how about both? Do boast? Uh, same. Same. So notice here, um, this is kind of interesting. He moves from verse 11, which was past indicative. Now in verse 12, he's giving a present imperative. But, but the present imperative is kind of interesting because he's referring to something they did in the past. All right? Because he introduces in verse 11 what these people did that they were being judged for. But then in verse 12... He gives these present commands, which it sounds like there's something that's going to happen. They're being commanded not to do. But actually, he's he's still continuing from verse 11 and describing um, what they did. So what's going on here? Why is, why is he doing it this way? Why are the, verse 12, why is it worded in the form of these present imperatives, you think? Um, is he giving them a chance to repent? Well, it, 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 it could sound like that, except he's already declared judgment. And right after verse 10, where he declares judgment, he then gives the reason, you two are as one of them, when the foreigners entered Jerusalem and took advantage of them, uh, you, you were doing the same thing. But then... Is that the warning, Brad Pastor Tim, for the readers not to follow the actions of those people? It, it could, but again, it, it seems to be directed to still towards the Edomites who he's speaking to in verse 10 and verse 11. Mm. Yeah, it's a little tricky. Is it like, I know, Pastor Tim, um, like, if we somehow paraphrase it, like, you're already judged, so do not, or there's judgment for you, so do not gloat, do not, something like that. Uh, explain what you mean. Like, uh, how do you say? Not post in the day of their distress. Oh, sorry. Did you want to look at the... Yeah. Maybe it's like an ultimatum. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> you're judged, so... Oh, I see what you're saying. Somehow, like, don't, don't bother boasting. Don't bother yeah, judging, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, it's not it's not going to do you any good. What's that? Uh, maybe they are judged, but they, they are already judged, but they continue doing. Look, let's keep this question in mind, and we'll, we'll keep uh, going. Can I try? What's that, Sandy? Can I try? Yeah, sure. Actually, in verse 10, the judgment was already been there. And in verse 11, uh, God told them this, uh, uh, the reason of the judgment. And 
I think verse 12 means do not gloat, do not rejoice, do not boast. I think this is the act that uh, the people of Edom did the time when the Israelites has been uh, punished by God uh, during those, those days. Yeah, I think That's, you're on the right track. But um, I think you're on the right this, track. This, this, is, this is their mood. This is their act. This is their, their uh, how they treat the people of Judah during this time. Yes. So remind them, this is what you've done. That's why yes. I'm judging you. I think that's the reason. Uh, this the, the this is the catching things that, that the word do gloat, do rejoice, and do boast. Yeah, I think I think you're on the right track. Um, let's do another verse, and then I want to come back to this question. But I think Sandy's got the right idea. This is a, a unique way to express something. That's why I wanted to point it out to you because verse 13 basically. He carries on the same, uh, same approach with the verbs as he did in verse 12. Um, let me have, let's see, John, uh, I don't think, have you done it yet? Not yet, Pastor Tim. Okay, why don't you take verse 13? Okay, uh, verse 13 says, Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster and do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. Mm. Somewhat the same kind of verbs. Uh, do enter, do gloat, and do loot. Yeah. And then what is the... Uh... It's still present, imperative, and active. Yeah. Yeah, it's the also. same for each of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he just continues. Um, he just continues doing the same thing that he did in verse 12, um, where he gives these commands, and he states them. And the same present imperative active. And it's the same actually in verse 14. Do not stand. Do not imprison. All right. So notice here, verses 12 to 14 are these present imperative active commands. But my question is, why, why did he say it in the present? It seems to be like, I think Sandy's right, that these are things that they did. Because it's introduced in verse 11 that foreigners entered the gate of Jerusalem, they cast lots, and you were as one of them. And then it's describing the day of his misfortune, the day of their distress, the day of their destruction. Well, who's that? Israel. Judah, right? Jerusalem. So they suffered this day of destruction and distress by some foreigners, or they were called strangers, right? In verse 11. And Edom was being judged because they participated, right? You two were as one of them. Now, the reason I think that um, Obadiah presents verses 12 to 14 in the form of these present imperatives is that that's a poetic divide. That's a poetic way to rebuke them. They were, had already done it. They were gloating. They were rejoicing. They were boasting. They were looting. And God speaks to them as if it was happening at that moment. And he's rebuking them at that moment. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, they already had done it, but this was a poetic way uh, to, to rebuke them. Sometimes you'll see this where... Um, you know, like, I don't know if you guys are parents and maybe you walk in and one of your children is hitting your other child. And they've already done it. OK, they've already went in and hit and you go in and you say, don't hit your brother. Well, they already did it. And you're you're 
you're rebuking them by by telling them, you know, don't do that. Even if they've already done it. Now, you could go in and say, you know, you shouldn't have hit your brother. Like verse 11 is that way, past indicative active. You were as one of them. Um, so you could tell your child, you know, you, you are not supposed to hit your brother. Or you could say, don't hit your brother. Even though they already did it, you are giving them an instruction that's really the, an, a rebuke because they'd already done it. Does that make sense? I think so, that's what's but, happening here. Yeah, Ruel? So the, the, the reason of doing it is for uh, so that the command would become more direct? Or Yeah, it's or more forceful. It's a more forceful rebuke, I think. They right. don't, don't do that. Don't gloat. Don't, you know, they've already done it. But the rebuke is coming in the form of a command as if they were doing it at that moment. And so a really a poetic way to express the, the um, unhappiness uh, of the Lord against them as he's rebuking them. But it's something they already did. I just I didn't want you to be thrown off by the present tense imperative, make, seeming as if they were doing it then. It's something they've already done. That's why God's already declared judgment on them. Okay? He won't, he won't declare judgment on somebody if they haven't done it yet. Right? Uh, he, he won't say, okay, you're being judged. You know, don't, don't do that, but I'm, I'm going to judge you anyway, even though you haven't done it yet. No, that's, that's not what God would do, but he would say, you, you have already done it. That's why there's consequences. But he expresses his rebuke toward them by giving these present tense commands. Uh, basically declaring what they've already done. So does that make sense? Are there questions about that? I just bring it up because you'll find this sometimes, especially in the prophetic genre, when rebuke is being delivered. Sometimes that rebukes in the form of a command in the present, but it's something they've already done. And so you'll see that once in a while. We see that here in this case. Okay, so analyzing the verb tenses uh, show us, one, the, the future tense is given for the, the consequences, the judgment that is to come, hasn't happened yet. The present or the past tense in verse 11 was in describing events that already took place. The present imperative was used in verses 12 to 14 as a form of rebuke. And though it's present tense verb, it actually is referring to something they already did. So, so Pastor Tim, it would be a wrong interpretation if we look at it uh, as a warning. Yes, in this case, because they've already received the judgment for their action. Obadiah, the whole book, is, is judgment upon the Edom for what they did. So... You have to look at the whole context. Now, in some in some places, it, it is a warning. You know, and it's a command not to do something, or else you'll be judged. You know, that's Joel, the book of Joel. He tells them to repent, or else something worse is coming. So there, you just and so this is why I'm, I'm bringing this up because it it really emphasizes the importance of knowing the context. You know, everything that's been said. So if interpreting if you, is not that easy. I'm sorry. Interpreting the scripture is not that easy. <laughs> not, anyway. not often. Yes, yeah, Sandy. Um, excuse me, Pastor Tim, because uh, as I have known, we 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 study uh, Tia because our goal is to have or to reach the right interpretation, right? Because yes, correct. By, yeah, the Bible has a right interpretation. So when I look this study, especially in this verse and the verb and the, the kind of mood, so does it mean when we did not get the right verb, mood, and voice, 
we do some wrong interpretations in the Bible? Does that does it mean? Yeah, because for example, let's say you just said, okay, uh, this is a present imperative verb. So God's telling these people not to do this, not to gloat or rejoice or boast. Um, if I just look at the verse 12 and I don't consider the verses around it, then I might come up with that conclusion. But what we have to understand is if you read the whole book of Obadiah, which is just one chapter, you see that God has already declared judgment upon the Edomites. Actually, he's declared it in multiple places, but we see it again in verse 10. He declares it because of violence to your brother Jacob. So they've already committed violence against Jacob, their, their Jewish brothers. Because of that, you will be cut off and covered with shame. So judgment's declared based on something they've already done. So that sets the context. Then verse 11 describes the specific event that took place where they did this, this violence. Okay? So that tells us Edom's already done, uh, you know, committed the sin, uh, done the violence against Jacob. God's already declared judgment. And then verse 11 and following then must be describing the specifics of what they did. But um. verse 12, 13, and 14, the rebuke is given in the form of a command. Like I said, uh, with the example with your kids, if, if one child's hitting another and, and they've already done it and you come in the room and say, okay, you're in trouble. Don't hit your brother. All right. You're not, you're not telling them something to do now. What you're telling them is they already did it and it was a, it was a great wrong and you give it as a command to really emphasize the rebuke that it was wrong. Uh, okay. Them last question in relation yeah. to this. So uh, when the when Obadiah wrote this his book, is the judgment of Edom was done already? Yes. Oh well, did did had the judgment already been carried out? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, no, no, it hadn't yet. And that's why it says you will be covered. You will be cut off. So, but in the mind of God, it's already a done deal. So there's no room for uh, relenting. Not in this, not in this particular um, case here. Many times there is a call to repentance, especially when it is dealing with the people of Israel. There's a call to repentance. We see that in in Joel, for example, as I mentioned a moment ago. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, sometimes it's, you know, they've committed the sin and judgment is coming and there's no call to repentance. Pastor Tim? Yeah. Uh, could this be applied to some genre? It be applied to what? I'm sorry? Could, uh, because we just do some interpretations in this genre, my question is, can be also applied to the other genre? Oh. The things that we study today. You mean doing this form of rebuke in the form of an imperative? No, those verb, nouns, things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we do that. We call it textual observations. Yeah, we do that for the other genres, especially epistles and poetry, because those are instructional. So if it's an instructional genre, we want to really take a close look at some of the grammar, like the verbs, the pronouns, um, repetition, because that will help us to, to uh, better understand the text. Like right now, we're talking about just the verbs and understanding how they're being used in this particular passage. Thank you, Pastor Tim. So that's a good question. But yeah, this step is uh, we have to do it for each each of the genres in order to help um, uh, 
help give some more insight into the meaning of the passage. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So on, on textual observation, there's a, there's a number of things we're looking for, but the first and most important is the verbs. Uh, another thing we want to look for is we want to identify the pronouns as well. Um, pronouns are very important to consider to identify in a passage because uh, sometimes they can get, um, if you don't rightly understand how the pronouns are working, again, you may, you may misinterpret. So with pronouns, we want to consider a couple of things. We want to identify each pronoun in the passage we diagram and what the pronoun refers to. Again, remember, a pronoun just points to a noun. All right. Uh, so there's the first person pronouns, which is I, singular, or we, or us, or my. Okay. Second person pronoun is you or your, and that can be singular or plural. Third person is speaking of he or she, uh, they, their, his, hers. Okay. So those are. What we want to do when we look at a passage, identify, okay, is this a first person or second person or third person pronoun? And then what does that pronoun refer to? Okay. So, for example, let's look back at our passage in Obadiah. And what we see here is looking at verse um, 10. I'll do the first one and I'll call on you guys for the others. Because of the violence done to your second person pronoun, brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be cut off forever. So all of these are second person, you and your second person. And it's referring to, if you go to the previous verses, it's referring to the Edomites. Or sometimes they're called Esau because they came from Esau. All right, that's found from looking at the previous verses. So if we do verse 11, go back to Joshua. If you're there, Joshua, can you do verse 11? Just identify the pronouns and what kind they are. Uh, okay, Pastor Tim, I can't seem to see the screen. Oh, I'm sorry, because I didn't share it. <laughs> All that? right, so let me show you mine again. I'm sorry. <laughs> um. So because of violence done to your brother, Jacob, you will be covered. You will be cut off. Those are all second person referring to the Edomites uh, based on earlier verses. So, okay. Can you see this now? Yes, I can see it now, Pastor Tim. Sorry. Thank you. Verse 11. Uh, okay. Um, huh? You. Okay. Uh, is is good, <clears throat> and another you. Okay, and another his. I'll put that in a different color. Or right, in so, our and then we have. There's one more actually. I just saw. Other -ish. One more pronoun. Yeah, his gate. Yeah, oh, his there's gate. another one. There's another one. And that day that strangers carried off foreigners and third the gates cast lots. One. One of them. Uh, uh, them. Yeah, them, one them, is them. actually, but them. Them is the one I was. All right, so we have you here. Who's that? What? What? Uh, is that first, second, or third person? Second. Yeah, second person, uh, right? Second person. And then, who does it refer to? Edomites. Edomites. Yep, 
It's still the Edomites, right? The, the U, it's the U from verse 10. Now, how about his? Is that first, second, or third person? Uh, brother Jacob. Okay, yeah, it refers to Jacob, but who is it first, second, or third person? Oh, uh, second. Well, second is you. Oh, wait. Third, third. Third, third. Yeah, third person. All right, third person. And yeah, it refers to Jacob. Or as we know here, uh, or it says also Jerusalem, right? Cast lots for Jerusalem. Okay, you two are as one of them. Now, who does the them, uh, or sorry, what case is that, or person is that, first, second, or third? Them is the other person, possibly the people who punish Israel. During yeah. The time. You is it first, second, or third person, though? Let's do that first. Fourth, third. Third, third person. Yep. Yeah, and it refers to the enemies of the foreigners, or... right? All right. On the day that strangers carried off his wealth, foreigners entered his gate. You uh, were as one of them, strangers and foreigners. Does that make sense, Joshua? Uh, first. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. All right, good. All right. Um, Sandy, why don't you take verse 12? Are you there, Sandy? Do not gloat over your brother. Your is a pronoun. Okay. The day of his misfortune, he's also a pronoun. And do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the days of their, their is a pronoun. Do not boast in the day of their again is a pronoun. Do not boast. Okay, there. All right, good. So, your is the second is person. Second person, and who does it refer to? Jacob. Yeah, your brother. Well, your brother's day. Your brother's day. Yeah, Jacob. Brother is Jacob, but your is, refers to whom? Do not gloat your brother. Yeah, your. Uh, Who's the your? Your is uh, Judah. Jacob. No, Edom. That's right. The Edomites. Edomites? Yeah. <laughs> He's speaking to the Edomites, right? You, look at verse 11. You stood aloof. You two were as one of them. That's the Edomites, right? He's still speaking to them in verse 12. Do not gloat over your brother's day. Now, the brother is Jacob, but your is Edom because it's your brother, Edom's brother, Jacob. You follow me? Yeah, the day of his misfortune, third person, his. Yeah, his, third person, and that refers to? The day of his misfortune. Jacob. Yeah. Yeah, Jacob or, or Jerusalem, actually, is the, it's mentioned in there. Or technically here, first it would be your brother, right? Uh, which is Jacob, Jerusalem. Okay, how about there? Third person, the same. Yeah, third person. And again, refers to your brother. Okay, good. All right, good. Okay, well, I think you guys get the idea. All right, notice here again, it's referencing uh, you. The you here is this message is directed to the Edomites. So that second person is them. The, the third person refers to people of Jerusalem or Judah or, or Jacob. Different names are used. Okay. We won't do the, the rest here for the sake of time because we're running out of time. All right. So. Verbs and then pronouns are things you're going to look for. The third type of um, 
word or expression you're going to look for is the conjunctions. Okay, and we spent a lot of time talking about conjunctions uh, last year. If you remember that long uh, time we spent, you know, working on uh, diagramming, looking at English grammar in particular. Now, conjunctions are, are very important words that, that uh, are used. And there's two types. If you remember, try to review real quick. Remember, we have the coordinating and subordinating. All right. Uh, conjunctions link link together, and then the coordinating conjunctions can link words or phrases or clauses that are grammatically equal. Okay, and there's five conjunctions, uh, coordinating conjunctions: and, nor, but, or, yet. You remember and boy? Oh, I remember those days. Don't bring that up again, Pastor Tim. That was painful. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but um, to, it's important let's to, to remind ourselves of those. The coordinating conjunctions, they connected, um, they could connect words or phrases or clauses, but whatever they connected were grammatically the same. And that's important. So they could connect to phrases. They could connect to words, they could connect to prepositions, they could connect to clauses, but they always connected the same thing grammatically. Um, so, for example, my favorite um, activity is to read and to write. Okay, notice here, and is the conjunction, right? And it connects to read with to write. Both of these are infinitives. Or I could have made the sentence this way. I like to read and I like to write. In this case, again, and is the coordinating conjunction. It's connecting to closets. I like to read. And I like to write. Or you could connect words. He ate uh, balut and um, bread and luchon. That would not be a very healthy meal there, but it would be good. Notice here. Delicious. Delicious. <laughs> Here, it's connecting three words, technically three objects, balut, bread, and luchon. Okay, so, so the coordinating conjunction connects two uh, grammatically equal words, phrases, or clauses. A subordinating conjunction always connects a dependent clause to the word it modifies. All right, so subordinating, and here's a, a list of subordinating ones. The coordinating is just five, easy to remember, and, nor, but, or, yet. Subordinating is actually a long list. These are the most common ones, uh, and I, I use the acronym FSWABIT to remember uh, them, but this, these uh, are the more common ones that you'll find, and they connect. Um, so I like to read for it helps my memory. All right, here the four is a subordinating conjunction because it's connecting this independent, uh, this dependent clause. It helps my memory to the word like, why I like it. Because it helps my memory. Okay. Yeah. Subordinating conjunctions. I think most of them are used for reasoning. For reasoning? Is that what you said? Yeah. Reason for. Yeah. A subordinating conjunction often will answer the questions why or yeah, reason or how or when or where. So, for example, I like to read 
when I am um, alert. Okay, here, the subordinating conjunction is when, and it, it's telling us when I like to read. So I, okay, or, so that's when, or it could be how. I, I uh, read the book by uh, um, opening it. <laughs> Dumb sentence, but get the idea. So by, uh, no, no, sorry, this is a bad example. Scratch that. Um, I read the book. What would be? Though I am tired. Though I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Though I'm tired, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a different, that's a concession. That would be, a, that's a conjunction here, subordinating. And it connects I am tired to read. It's, it's a concession in this case. So it's not just the reason, but subordinating conjunctions can also answer when or, con, or a concession or if. Um, if I am awake, I will read the book. Okay, here, if I am awake, if is a subordinating conjunction, and it gives the condition. I will read if I'm awake. So I, I indent it next to, to will read. So what you want to do in this step is just look for either these, these conjunctions and identify is it coordinating or subordinating conjunction. So let's do a couple, uh, and then we'll probably have to end, end our time here. All right, Ruel, I'm going to ask you to start us off here. Verse 10, do you see any conjunctions? And maybe what I can do, I'll try to, here. I'll keep these. Close by, so you can really keep. All right. Do you see any conjunctions in verse 10? Uh, first word, uh, because. Yes. Because. Two. Because Any others? And two. Or two. Well, two is a preposition here in this case. Because notice what follows it. Your brother. That's not a clause. There's no verb. And. And. Good. Okay, those are the two. I. So we have because of. What kind of a conjunction is because? Is it a coordinating? Um, subordinating. Subordinating. Subordinating, right. Because coordinating is just these five. Yeah. All right. So if it's not one of these five, it has to be subordinating. It's, uh, right. I'm so it's subordinating, it's telling why uh, you will be covered and cut off. Okay. All right. How about that and? Uh, subordinating. Okay, let's look at our, sorry, let me catch up here. And, okay, notice, let's first look, Amboy, is it one of the coordinating ones? Coordinating, yes. Yes, coordinating. And what is it connecting? It connects, uh, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. Yes, very good. So it's it's connecting those two independent clauses in this case. All right. Again, two grammatically equal parts. All right, very good. John, let me give you verse 11. Hmm. 
there's and I'm not sure if that faster team is uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. I'll just highlight it blue. And this on the this that this that yeah. <laughs> here? Yes. Or that, this that. that. <laughs> that that or this that? <laughs> that that. <laughs> okay. Um because there's another one here. Yeah. There any other conjunctions? There's another and yeah. Them. Good. Okay. Well, let's do the ands first, uh, and then we'll talk about the that. All right. And first and is that coordinating or subordinating? It's coordinating. Yep, it's in the Amboy. And what is it connecting? Uh, on the day that strangers carried off and foreigners. Yeah, strangers carried off foreigners with and foreigners entered his gate. So two clauses, it's connecting together. All right, good. How about the... the um, Second and the other end is still coordinating. Yeah. <clears throat> so like What's it connect? <clears throat> making somehow making a list. Foreigners enter the yeah. State. Yeah, it's now it's adding a third. So it connects Locked. the strangers, or technically it connects the foreigners. foreigners. Entered, entered in, with cast lots. Okay. All right. Good. Again, equal. Again, it's a, uh, it's a clause, connecting a clause. Now, the that, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth. Remember that the word that is a peculiar word in English. It has multi-use, yeah. multi-verse. It's a multi-verse. It's many functions. So that can act like um, it can be a subordinating conjunction. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so that. So it gives a purpose or result of something. I, uh, I like to exercise that I would feel Good. healthy. Okay, that, that would be an example. Or... The word that can function like a relative pronoun. I like that. <laughs> well, I am the man that called you. Or uh, so a relative pronoun like the word which. So if you can put what I like to do is and then, yeah, that can also be a, a, a pronoun like I like that. But a relative pronoun, which, so what I do is if I'm not sure, I just put the word which in instead of that and see if it makes sense. On the day, which strangers carried off as well? Does that make sense? No. If, I, if I use which instead of that. I think it's more of when, Pastor Tim. Right, but... Um, yeah, but it's in this case, it's not, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, on the day when, or it could be which, because it's describing which day. Which day, yeah. Okay. It can be. So normally that is not used to be when. Uh, it's normally used either as a relative pronoun, which, or it can be a conjunction, or it can be a, what's called a demonstrative pronoun. Demonstrative. Or it can introduce a direct object. So, for example, he said that I could come for dinner. Now, here, the that is introducing, it's the object of, of said, what he said. 
right? So, so that can be a very confusing um, word in English. But normally it's going to be one of these two, conjunction or relative pronoun. And the way I check it is I just put the word which in place of that and see if it makes sense. If it does, then it's functioning like a relative pronoun. Yes. All right. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Well, nosebleed. I can see it happening again. So <laughs> I will give you. Um, so on the assignment, I I do I do the do this for all of the verses. So you can look on the assignment and see uh, what I put for the rest of these verses. And then also the other, we didn't get a chance to look at the other uh, observations. Maybe we'll do that next week. I'll, I'll think about it. But um, there's look for contrast or comparison, look for lists. And we have a list here, don't we? In this passage, do not gloat, do not rejoice, do not boast, do not enter, do not loot, right? That's a list, a list of commands in this case. Um, so we have a list in the passage. Um, purpose or result statements. Well, we saw one in verse 10, didn't we? Because of your violence to your brother Jacob. So look for those as well. Conditional clauses. Um, I don't believe there were any in this in this. Uh, passage. So you look for the words if, basically, that's the, the clue. Um, and then the tone. Now, the tone of this passage is clearly one of judgment, right? God's declaring judgment, so it's a very stern tone, a very harsh tone. All right, so those are the things to look for in the textual observations of the passage. All right, so maybe we'll do a couple more next time. I'll, I'll see what, what we have left to, to cover together. But you can start working on the assignment if you would like, uh, because I have posted it. Okay. And like I said, hopefully by next week, I will be able to get to you what, um, what assignments you have remaining. Uh, but you can go on Canvas yourself and, and look and make sure. And you can check the message I sent you a few weeks ago. Just look there as well. Okay. Okay, Pastor Tim. All right. Well, thank you for your diligence, your patience, your endurance. <laughs> um, uh, appreciate that. I, I know the Lord will bless you for that. And those uh, in to the, to the end will be saved. <laughs> <laughs> those who endure to the end will graduate. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. All right, very good, brothers. If there's no questions, then uh, I'll we'll uh, see see you again uh, next next Friday and do a little bit more together. Any questions before we leave? A uh, last 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 pastor team that that uh, the common uh, that the obvious stance. Did you explain already the obvious stance? Oh, Aris tense. Yes. Yeah, that's a Greek tense um normally it's translated as past tense in english but uh, okay but in greek it has a, a different idea um than just it's not just a past tense verb greek has present tense imperfect future perfect, perfect clue perfect um Arist, I think there's one more. So, so it's a little more complicated in Greek, but the aorist tense refers to basically looking at an action as a whole, normally the, a completed action. So that's why it's often translated past tense in English. Yeah, Greek is very complicated, Pastor Tim, because we study one week in Greek. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> 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 yeah we'll stick with english the english though is yes. uh is closer you know it's pretty close to the greek as far as the grammatical function 
not the exact, not exactly the same, but it's very similar in a lot of ways. So the things we've learned from the English, the participles and prepositions and clauses and uh, conjunctions, all of those things you find in Greek and they function similarly in English. So we are learning how the original language functions. It's not exactly the same, but it's, it's fairly close in many ways. So All right, let me, uh, let me ask John to close us in prayer if there's no other 